You're eating clean and healthy, or so you think. But somehow, your gut still feels like a hot air balloon. Ever felt that? It's pretty unpleasant. So what gives? Well, while vegetables can be a healthy part of a delicious diet, some can also cause really unpleasant gastrointestinal symptoms like bloating, constipation, diarrhea, and flatulence, often at the most unfortunate of social moments. I mean, when the tax on cauliflower is funeral farts, it's time to make a change. This video is gonna review the top 10 vegetables people struggle to digest. We're gonna break down pun intended, the biological why behind the bloating and arm you with strategies not just to avoid these foods, but to actually improve their digestibility using science-backed preparation methods and targeted enzymatic support. I promise you're going to walk away from this video feeling more like a gut-savvy scientist than a one-man brass band. All right, let's get started with numbers one through four cauliflower and its cruciferous cousins. Cauliflower might be public enemy number one on the list of low-carb keto-friendly vegetables that cause bloating. And it's a shame too, because I sincerely love a good roasted garlic cauliflower mashed potato on Thanksgiving. It's really the best. I actually think it's better than mashed potato if you use enough butter. Anyway, one major reason cauliflower can cause digestive upset is because it's rich in a sugar called raffinose. Raffinose is a trisaccharide, tri meaning three, and it's composed of three simple sugars, galactose, glucose, and fructose. Raffinose is non-digestible to humans and other monogastric one-stomach animals like pigs and chickens. Therefore, raffinose passes into the large intestine, the colon, where it can be fermented by certain bacteria that possess the enzyme to break it down, and this leads to the generation of gas and associated signs and symptoms of bloating and flatulence. Now, there are a few clever ways to deal with this problem. The first is boiling. When high raffinose foods are soaked and or boiled, some of the raffinose leaches out into the cooking water because raffinose is water soluble. This reduces the raffinose content of the food itself. In one study, for example, soaking followed by boiling reduced raffinose levels by 57.6%. Now, before we move on to the rest of this video, which I promise is chocolate block full of tips and practical tricks and our other nine vegetables, I did take the liberty of doing an experiment to prove the point loudly. I took two heads of cauliflower and chopped them up and boiled one. I then roasted the boiled head of cauliflower along with the raw head of cauliflower and turned each into cauliflower mashes by blending them with butter, salt, and cream. I then portioned them into four separate containers, two of the pre-boiled cauliflower mashes and two of the control just roasted cauliflower mashes. I then ran an experiment. I ate each container on a separate day, spaced three days apart each. I labeled each container with a sticky note and then covered it and shuffled them randomly to blind myself. I then recorded a key metric called flatulence frequency. You can figure out what that is. The number of farts I had in the 24 hours following the consumption of each container, again, in a blinded fashion. What were the results? The roasted cauliflower alone resulted in 24 to 33 farts per day. The boiled version, a semi-polite 15 to 18. Now, while no experiment is perfect, my baseline flatulence frequency, yes, I know that metric, is fewer than four farts per day probably on account of the fact that I generally eat a pretty low vegetable, low fiber diet, and I didn't otherwise change my food intake. I know, I know, it's an N equals one and not peer reviewed study, but my ears don't lie. Now, another way to reduce raffinose issues, getting back on track here, is to take a digestive enzyme, specifically one containing alpha galactosidase. Alpha galactosidase is an enzyme that breaks down raffinose. So among soaking, boiling and alpha-galactosidase-containing digestive enzymes, you can turn down the bloat on Thanksgiving's favorite potato substitute. 
Other high raffinose foods in this category are other cruciferous vegetables, number two to four on our list, including broccoli, Brussels sprouts, and cabbage. So the same tips apply to these, boiling and enzyme supplementation with alpha-galactosidase to break down raffinose. And as another helpful note, low raffinose alternatives include zucchini and spinach. Also note, raffinose is not the only flatulence fiend in the cruciferous vegetable world. Glucosinolates are another class of compounds found in broccoli, cauliflower, cabbage, and their kin, and can cause similar digestive issues, but via distinct mechanisms. Glucosinolates are sulfur-containing compounds that can be broken down into hydrogen sulfide gas, which contributes to bloating and flatulence, with a particular sulfurous odor. Now, boiling will also help reduce glucosinolate levels. That trick works too. Reduce them up to 70% in some foods. Now, I can't help but going on a quick but fascinating tangent for those who want to dig just a little bit deeper into the science behind hydrogen sulfide gas, especially its production from glucosinolates. This is a surprisingly complex and nuanced topic. And while I won't take you through the intricacies of desulfahydration, dissimilatory sulfate reduction, and assimilatory sulfate reduction, yes, these are real things, I do want to highlight that hydrogen sulfide acts as a signaling molecule in the body with both harmful and potentially protective effects. With respect to inflammation, the data are actually mixed. Some research suggests that hydrogen sulfide gas promotes inflammation and may exacerbate conditions like inflammatory bowel disease, ulcerative colitis, and Crohn's disease by damaging intestinal epithelial cells. And just being honest with you, as an inflammatory bowel disease, ulcerative colitis patient myself, even the possibility of a flare or relapse makes me really hesitant to eat foods rich in glucosinolates. Maybe I'm being paranoid, but that's just the truth. However, other studies show that hydrogen sulfide might have a protective effect in different contexts, such as reducing damage from alcohol-induced and NSAID-induced gastritis. So while it plays a role in gut signaling, the inflammatory outcomes of hydrogen sulfide can vary depending on context, how high are the levels, and how do they interact with particular host, you, me, particular host sensitivities. And there's also evidence that hydrogen sulfide can signal to slow down peristalsis, the rhythmic contractions that move food and waste through your intestines. In plain English, too much hydrogen sulfide might slow your gut down, contributing to constipation. Basically, your digestive tract goes from a slip and slide to a lazy river, and not the fun kind with margaritas and pool floaties. And finally, before we get to number five and six on our list, a couple of quick lifestyle tips to avoid making things worse. Try to avoid eating food too fast and skip the carbonated beverages. Both of these can introduce excess air into the digestive system, making bloating worse. Okay, now we're ready for number five and six, onions and garlic. Onions and garlic belong to the allium family, which are typically rich in fructans. Fructans are polymers of fructose and are in the larger group FODMAPs. Maybe you've heard of FODMAPs. FODMAPs stand for fermentable oligosaccharides, disaccharides, monosaccharides, and polyols. And these compounds are typically difficult to digest and contribute to gas and bloating. The solution here, again, can be targeted digestive enzymes, in particular those that contain fructan hydrolases such as Fodzyme. I don't have an affiliation with this enzyme supplement, but that's just an example. So generally, these foods, onions and garlic, can cause bloating because they have fructans, which can be broken down by enzyme supplementation. Fructan hydrolases. And seven, that's seven, on our list is artichokes, which are also high in fructans, so the same tricks apply. Now moving on to numbers eight through 10, tomatoes, eggplants, bell peppers, the nightshades. Tomatoes, eggplants, and bell peppers all belong to a group called nightshades and contain compounds, two in particular I want to talk about, called glycoalkaloids and lectins. Glyco means sugar, so glycoalkaloid means a sugar component attached to the main nitrogen-containing alkaloid structure. In brief, they're basically nature's pesticides. As for lectins, 
These are carbohydrate binding proteins with a really diverse array of effects in the body. But to quote from one recent review article, which I found quite interesting and I'll link below, dietary lectins may attach to pancreatic islet cells, activating an autoimmune reaction against these cells and contributing to the development of type 1 diabetes and beta cell destruction. And lectins can also attach to glucosaminoglycans and proteoglycans in synovial fluid and joints, potentially causing autoimmune rheumatic inflammatory diseases. High level, lectins can stimulate autoimmune conditions, and potentially, therefore, are a little bit dangerous. There are many different types of lectins. Phytohemagglutinin is one popular one, found in legumes, for example. Levels can be so high in uncooked red kidney beans, it can cause toxicity, nausea, vomiting, and diarrhea. Thankfully, cooking reduces these levels massively. Raw red kidney beans contain about 70,000 hemagglutinin units, but this is reduced to between 200 and 400 hemagglutinin units when properly cooked. This is just an example about what an amazing difference cooking can make. It's really incredible that we generated it as a species. That said, I just want to say lectins aren't all bad. While they can be pro-inflammatory and stimulate autoimmune conditions, some are anti-inflammatory. It really depends on the specific lectin and interactions with the unique elements of the host, you versus me. So while I don't mean to blanket vilify lectins and the foods containing them, it is fair to raise a caution. Now, what can you do? In general, with lectins, the key is to use high heat methods to deactivate them. Soaking can also help, as can fermentation and sprouting. So in terms of a cooking method, for example, you can boil or soak your eggplant and then roast it at 400 degrees Fahrenheit. Stir frying also walks. Get it? And another compound, now moving on, past my stupid puns, is Histamine. We need to talk about histamine. Histamine is a signaling chemical that plays a role in immune and allergic reactions. Some people have what's called histamine intolerance, and these folks can get symptoms like flushing, brain fog, bloating, constipation, abdominal pain, and diarrhea when they eat foods rich in histamines like many nightshades, including tomatoes, but also other foods like aged cheeses, wine, fermented foods, and spinach. To break this down a little more, histamine intolerance occurs when the body's capacity to eliminate histamines is exceeded by the rate of histamine intake or accumulation. So in healthy individuals, the way it should work is an enzyme in the intestines called diamine oxidase, or DAO for short, it breaks down or eliminates histamine from foods. But this DAO enzyme can be inhibited by genetic factors or environmental factors, including certain medications. In fact, about 20% of at least the European population consumes medications that could decrease DAO activity. Additionally, certain nutrient deficiencies, including vitamin C and copper deficiency, can contribute to histamine intolerance via DAO activation, leading to histamine reactions. A few possible solutions for people with histamine intolerance or people concerned about histamine intolerance. First, with respect to tomatoes, a histamine culprit, green tomatoes are much, much lower in histamine than ripe red tomatoes. Also, back to enzyme supplementation, you can get DAO enzyme supplements that help replace dysfunctional or underactive DAO in the body and can improve symptoms. Now, we've gone through our 10, but I want to give a note on mushrooms. While technically not plants, mushrooms aren't plants, many are high in FODMAPs, and you can use similar tricks, soak, boil, and cook thoroughly. Also, as a fun fact, oyster mushrooms in particular are a low FODMAP food. They're kind of an exception. So if you're someone who appears sensitive to FODMAPs, oyster mushrooms are like your digestive safe haven in the fungal kingdom. Gentle, gut-friendly, and full of umami flavor without the aftermath. Now we're getting to the end, but let's pause for a second and tackle a big myth before we summarize the main tips, tricks, and takeaways having to do with fiber. The myth is fiber in vegetables is always good for gut health. Not exactly. Context matters. Your microbiome, your genetics, your epigenetics, and certain medical conditions all determine how well you tolerate different vegetables and different fibers. Take an extreme example. For some people, kale is just fine. For others, it's higher risk for a phytobezoar, 
a structure that lodges in the gastrointestinal system, kind of clogs it up. And a difficult lesson I learned during my radiology rotation when I saw some really striking images. But to cite some hardcore data, there are studies showing that fiber can be inflammatory in some people. Now, while this is a minority group, they do matter. And if for some, dumping a load of fiber into the system can actually make health and inflammation worse, then really we should stop with the platitudes like fiber is essential for gut health. It's not. So instead of thinking good versus bad, think right food in the right person at the right time. And for more on this hairy topic, please see this video on fiber. Now wrapping up, I want to summarize some big picture tips and takeaways. First, cooking helps a lot. Soaking, boiling, and baking, or otherwise cooking at high heat, can help remove or deactivate a lot of the compounds that are hard to digest. Second, you can try taking different specific digestive enzymes depending on your sensitivities, like those containing alpha-galactosidase for breaking down raffinose, or fructan hydrolases for breaking down fructans, or DAO enzymes for histamine intolerance. Tip three is more of an umbrella statement, but support your gut microbiome. While I've focused on the negatives of compounds in these foods, since the theme was hard to digest vegetables, admittedly, at no point did I say these foods were bad for your health. As a matter of fact, flatulence frequency isn't correlated with poor health, as far as I'm aware. It could just correlate with some physical and social discomfort. Get that? Anyway, it's worth considering to what degree you want to try to train your gut to handle these foods by introducing them in in small amounts, or by otherwise supporting your gut health through the intake of fermented foods and the elimination of processed foods. For more on microbiome health, I really would ask that you see my Microbiome Masterclass video. I intended that to be a broad overview to get you up to speed on the topic. And fourth, you can always find substitutes. That goes for basically anything in the diet world. For example, zucchini, carrots, avocados, cucumbers, and olives, although not are all technically vegetables, are generally well tolerated in the produce world, especially if you remove the seeds. Vegetables aren't the enemy. Yes, some contain tricky compounds that can challenge your gut, but that doesn't mean you have to live in fear of broccoli or give up garlic forever. With smart strategies like boiling, soaking, targeted enzyme use, you can improve your tolerance of these foods. Still, again, being real with you, some may opt to live a vegetable-free lifestyle. And I'm not against that choice. In fact, it's how I personally lean myself, at least now. So why did I go through the effort to even make this video exonerating, if you will, vegetables? Well, the answer is pretty simple. Different strokes for different folks. And some folks are just built to tango with turnips, while others would rather moonwalk past the purpose aisle with peace in their pants. I respect both camps. My job here is not to tell you what to do, but to arm you with information that will help support the lifestyle you choose. And hey, if you appreciated this hopefully non-dogmatic, nerdy yet human breakdown of veggie digestion, please hit that subscribe button not just for me, but to signal to the internet that nuance matters and that you want more of this. Let's keep exploring topics that makes science more human and guts less gassy. Tell me what you want to hear about next. Stay curious, and thanks. <laughs>